For the first three years of my undergrad, I never self-studied mathematics. I did whatever the professor told me to do. I went to their lectures, did their homeworks, read their materials, prepared for their exams. It was instructor focused. But as I got to the end of my undergrad, I started studying for myself, for my own interests, for my own passions. And it's a skill that lasted through my master's, my PhD, and all throughout my professor life. So that's the point of this video. How can we effectively self-study mathematics? Now, the first point I wanna make is it is just so liberating to finally study mathematics without the constraint of grades. I struggle with this as a professor where I have to give out a grade. That's one of my requirements for my job. But I want to show the coolest and most interesting parts of mathematics to get students to be intrinsically motivated to study math because intrinsic motivation, motivation that comes from you, is more effective for your learning, for learning behaviors than extrinsic motivation. Motivation that comes from external pressures to get a grade so you can get a degree so that that's going to be helpful and valued by society rightly or wrongly. Grades might motivate you in a moment, but it's not necessarily the best incentive structure for exploratory learning and following your passion and generally a more joyful experience. I remember a graduate course that I once took where the professor just didn't care about grades at all. It's, it's a little easier to do this in graduate courses. And uh, th there wasn't any assignments or anything I had to do, but on the very last day, I went to his office and he put an A beside my name and then said, okay, let's go and chat about the differential topology. And, and that was how I earned my A in this particular class. And it was just such a liberating experience because you can focus on the math and not the grades. Now, that said, learning mathematics on your own isn't always easy either. It can be isolating working on your own without all the supports of your friends who are there to collaborate with, with your professors and teaching assistants and math center tutors all there to support your learning. So, so this brings me to my first real point of this video, which is coming up with a good structure. How are you going to decide what you're going to learn on every specific day? What detail you're going to focus on? How are you going to practice to make sure you solidify that understanding? How are you going to assess that understanding to make sure that you've really got it? Let me take something like textbooks. When I was an undergrad, I didn't really like textbooks that much. I found them boring. But as a graduate student, I love textbooks. And I still do today. And part of the reason for it is that this is some expert who's put a lot of thought into creating a structure for you. I'll give you an example. Here on YouTube, I have a whole playlist on differential equations that lots of people watch. But I wouldn't say that that YouTube playlist is sufficient for mastering differential equations. There's not enough structure there. And I do give those videos to my students, but I give a lot more than just the videos. For example, I also have an online book. Uh, this is a free and unmonetized and an open source. I'm not trying to sell you anything, but you can click the link in the description if you're interested. And the point is that the book has more structure. It's not just videos. It's videos and lots of prose that's organized and most importantly, Lots and lots of exercises, which give you an opportunity to practice and assess your understanding. Now you have the structure for a much fuller experience than just watching videos on YouTube. Okay, so let's suppose you found some structure, but what are you actually gonna do in the day-to-day -day process of studying? Like, like, what is my ideal routine? Well, I have five phases to my self-studying routine. And number one is what I call predictions. Before I try to learn anything about a particular subject, I try to write down everything that I think is true about that particular subject. This might be very brief, like I might know nothing at all about it and make just one real quick prediction that turns out to be immediately false. It can also be like most of the session, like uh, last year I was preparing for a new course to me to teach, which was point set topology. And, and I, I'm an algebraic topologist, and there's, there's overlaps that are gonna be going here, but I'd never taken or taught the specific course. So I wanted to get really familiar and fluent with the content, make sure I was genuinely an expert for my students. And so what I would do for each section would be to try to write down and predict, like, what were the major definitions? What are the theorems? Can I prove them? What's the whole point? What's the big ideas? And just sort of put down on the page everything that I can. Regardless of how much you know and can predict, this just really primes you for the learning in the following stages. Okay, stage two is learning from the experts. I'm a big fan of active learning, but I think there's a big role to play by where an expert is going to structure the content for you. This is where you're reading the textbook or watching the video or going to the lecture. The content expert has structured a learning module of some form in some medium for you to be able to consume. 
I always encourage you to be actively thinking and questioning and making connections during this phase. But the, the emphasis in this phase gets pushed a little bit back to the expert and you're working through the materials that they have created. This is why I say choosing good resources to work through is really important. And I always like to vet the resource that I'm gonna spend a whole bunch of time investing on before I actually do that investment. But you can't just do this. So that's why there's stage three. And that is practice, practice, practice. The number one way that people, I would say, screw up in self-studying is they consume a lot of content, but then they don't practice it themselves. And this can be from the smallest, simplest, fundamental little details that are building up your de skills, developing your ability within the discipline, all the way up to more complex stuff where you're creating and you're putting things together. You need to be practicing. Actually, this is true for my students and classes as well. Everyone, for the most part, shows up to the lectures. The hard part is getting people to reliably do the practicing, do all those back of the book problems, grind out the practicing. This is the most important part. This is totally true for physical skills too. Like I'm trying to learn the game squash these days. There's all sorts of elements to the squash, but just mastering a fundamental, like hitting it down the sidewall reliably is just so important. Getting that practice in, getting those reps in, really builds your fundamentals to be able to succeed in the future. Step four is about connections. This is where you're pausing to reflect on the content that you're doing. You're trying to see the bigger picture. You're trying to see how what you're doing right now connects to all sorts of different things. You're trying to come up with questions that might come up in the future or questions that you want to go and solve about this content or questions that relate to the past that you've seen before. Now, effective learners actually are making these connections constantly throughout all the stages of the learning process, but I really like to carve out a specific dedicated stage for thinking about connections just to make sure that I actually do it. And finally, assessments. How do you assess how well you understood the content that you just learned? And whether the learning is going to stick in your long-term memory and be around for a long time versus just something that quickly fades as soon as you forget about the YouTube video that you just watched, say. As a professor of courses, assessments are important for, of course, for giving grades, but it's really that formative piece, that providing you with information that I think is the most important. So I would always identify a set of problems that I'm going to use to assess my understanding. And it can be something even as simple that you make up as like, can you still repeat and sort of describe a narrative of the big idea of the content that you've done? Can you still do that like three days after you learned it? But better yet is if you have problems reserved, spaced out in time is better than immediately after you've learned something, but you need something to be able to assess your understanding on. And, and, and let me tell you, you are going to fail your assessments far more than you think uh, humans tend to be biased to being overconfident about how well they've understanding something. And it's not until you actually get in those practice and the assessments that you realize there's little things that you're missing or, or things that are going to easily slip away when you haven't just learned it from an expert. So never shy away from constantly reassessing your understanding. Now, if you go through a, a five-step routine like I just described, that can be great. But what really matters is that you do it regularly over time, that you're able to form habits around it. Because in a regular class, the professor has a structure that imposes habits. Like if you just show up to class, well, three times a week, you're gonna be learning this. And you know, once a week you have a homework to do. A lot of that habit forming is built into the structure. You don't have to do much about it. You don't have to think about it. But if you're self-studying, forming the habits, I, I know it's easy to say, but forming the habits is one of the most important parts. Personally, I found that if you can build a pattern of doing something reliably, even if it's just 20 minutes a day of focused, intentional practice, this is better than doing some massive lift and trying to push for the entire day and, and get through a whole chunk of material. The regularity and the habit forming is the most important. I think centering your self-study experience on a why can be important. Why do you want to learn the thing that you're doing? For example, recently I have been learning Python. It's something I've been wanting to do for a very long time and I have a clear why, a clear purpose to this. And namely, I want to create a lot of cool math animations using Manum, which was originally created by 3 blue one brown which is a Python library. I have a purpose, I have a thing that I want to accomplish that's gonna hopefully make all of my math videos better. And so I was learning Python for this specific purpose. I had a why. 
but I also tried to have fun with it. At the beginning, I wasn't trying to make a specific YouTube video. I wasn't necessarily even working in the Manum library. I just wanted to learn the fundamentals of Python because I knew that if I had a, a strong understanding of the fundamentals of Python, that was gonna just really, really help me in the future. And I tried to find the joy and the fun of learning Python from the beginning, which I really did. I actually really enjoyed learning how to program in Python. Even those little details seemed sort of far and disconnected from my eventual goals. Even though some of the details didn't feel like I might never even use that in a future YouTube video animation, I still felt like all of those details, they, they were broadening my skill set. They were giving me that coding superpower, just as I encourage you to get a math superpower. And, and those enjoyment of the process and the road was important within the larger context of having a why, a purpose to why I was doing the learning that I was doing. Students can sometimes get caught up in a specific detail which doesn't immediately seem relevant. Or you might wonder, well, why is this actually gonna be useful in the future? And, and well, let's just suppose it, it's never gonna be used. Like even being vaguely aware of it will, will never give you some sense of where you should search for a problem in the future. Let's just assume it's entirely pointless. Even those pointless things are not pointless because you're developing your skill set. You're, you're practicing your problem solving and your ability to expand as a mathematician. And all of those fundamentals are gonna be, well, it's a slow road, but it's gonna help unlock those math superpowers. And so it's worth it. It's connected to perhaps a larger why, why you might be interested in self-studying mathematics. Now, everything I've talked about in this video, from the importance of structure to regular practice to assessment, I've talked about because I found them important as a student and as a professor. But one way you might get a lot of those things is with the sponsor of today's video, which is brilliant.org. Brilliant has a huge number of math, science, computer science courses that are just really well designed. We talked a lot in this video about the importance of regular practice. And what I appreciate about Brilliant so much is that interactive practicing is at the core of how they structure their lessons. You're constantly being put in the driver's seat, implementing what you just learned and assessing whether you truly mastered it. If not, they're gonna help you out so that by the time you build to more complex ideas like a neural network, you'll have mastered all the little details along the way that is so crucial for developing deep and fundamental understanding. Brilliant is cool enough to not have any influence on what I said in the rest of the video, but I do really think that a lot of the principles we talked about in this video, Brilliant has really taken to heart in the design and structure of their lessons. And that's why I'm so proud to be partnered with Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett or click the link down in the description to sign up for free for a full 30 days and see everything that they have. And if you use that link, you additionally get a 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, I do wanna say, do you like the new setup? I'm hanging out here in my new basement. My uh, three-year-old's going into the old office, so I'm stuck down here behind the piano. I hope you like the look. Probably have to tweak the audio a little bit because this is a very echoey room. We'll see some upgrades on that in the future, but tell me what you think. Regardless, we're gonna do some more math in the next video.